Hey everyone, it's Jamil Jude, your artistic director at Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater Company, and welcome to our community conversation on Next Gen Playwrights, the third community conversation in our joy and pain season. This season, we've been exploring the inextricable link of those two emotions in the lives of black people, and today's panel will explore what it means for contemporary playwrights to move beyond the struggle narrative. You all are in for a treat because this is gonna be moderated by Pearl Clegg and this panel is going to give you that heat. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't thank everyone who helped put this together. I wanna to give a special shout out to Brian Cave, Layton Paisner Law Firm and all the individual donors who helped make our work possible. It's thanks to you that we can thrive at the intersection of artistic excellence and civic engagement. This community conversation is just a small taste of the work that we've done this season. I encourage you to go over to our website, truecolorstheater.org, to check out all the things that we've been doing this year with the podcast and our new work program and some of our collaborations with other organizations, all that stuff you can find on our website. Y'all, I'm the only thing that is standing between you and a really good time, so let me get out the way. I ask that you put your virtual hands together for this panel and the amazing Clarissa Crawford and Pearl Clegg. Good evening. My name is Clarissa Crawford, and I'm an associate producer at Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater Company. And on behalf of True Colors Theater Company and our partnerships with working title playwrights and the city of South Fulton Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Next Gen Playwrights Beyond the Struggle. This is a timely community conversation on the narratives being shaped by emerging BIPOC playwrights in the Atlanta community. Tonight's events will, e will feature playwrights Dana Stringer, Suhaila Elatar, and Paris Creighton III. And joining as our special guest moderator is award-winning author and playwright, Pearl Clegg. Before we get into tonight's event, I want to tell you just a little bit about True Colors and some of the upcoming programs that you can look forward to. So True Colors' mission is to celebrate the rich traditions of Black storytelling while giving bold, bold voice to artists from all cultures. In this spirit, we are working to amplify Black voices, increase the reach of established artists nationally, and commission new works from emerging Black artists locally. Tonight's event is a testament of our commitment to that. We'll continue expanding on this work through our 18th anniversary season of Joy and Pain. You can look forward to our Divinely Connect commissions, where we are commissioning 10 early career artists across multiple disciplines to create work based on their interpretation of our Joy and Pain theme. We also have our new page commissions, where we will commission three mid-career playwrights to each create a one hour long play for digital presentation. We look forward to sharing these commission words with you in 2021. But before we get to 2021, <laughs> we still have some upcoming program that you can look forward to as we close out 2020. So on, De on Tuesday, December 1st, you can join us for Giving Tuesday. This day is marked by the power of generosity and it is a chance for people around the world to stand together in unity and use their individual power of giving to remain connected and to help us create more equitable opportunities and ultimately a more equitable world. We're asking you to make a donation and join us in our commitment to provide life-changing career opportunities for artists. When you donate to True Colors Theater Company, you're helping us to, our, to uphold our commitment to developing a national artistic home for Black voices, championing Black voices and stories of perseverance and joy, and celebrating Black lives that rise and create notable artistry. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter so that you can get more details and join us on Tuesday, December 1st. And also on Friday, December 4th, we're inviting you to join our fall 2020 interns for their presentation of Frame of Mind, which is a devised compilation of their work culminating their experience in our new digital playmaking internship program. These interns are coming from Emory, Clayton State, University of Oklahoma, and Howard University. After nine weeks together, they're ready to come and share their work with you, our True Colors community. So you can log on and support these young talents 
on thirds on Friday, excuse me, December 4th at 7.30 p.m. And of course, on Thursdays, every Thursday, you can join us on all of our social media platforms for our True Colors podcast, where we are delivering you new content featuring artist interviews, master classes, and local and live Q&A sessions. As we move through tonight's events, we'll invite you to also engage with us in our chat feature. You have an opportunity to connect with us and also other viewers and share different ahas that come up for you, any questions that you may have, which will also be a part of the live Q&A session that we'll have with our panelists later in the show. So make sure that you are active and participating with us and letting us know what you wanna know from our panelists. We'll also share a link so that you don't have to wait until Tuesday, December 1st to give. You can give to True Colors Theater Company tonight. Your support is so important in helping us to be able to amplify and celebrate artists and their work. Thank you in advance for your generosity. Okay. <laughs> so now that I've gotten through all the news that you can use, we're going to get into our conversation this evening. So I'm getting ready to turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves and a piece from their work. And from there, we'll get right into the conversation, which again, will be led by our special guest moderator, Pearl Clay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Paris Creighton III. I'm uh, honored to be here, especially with you all and with Miss Clegg. I will be doing a piece from my one-man show called Spare the Rod. <clears throat> my parents told me of a time when I was sick around Thanksgiving. I wasn't even two years old yet, and we were at my, my grandmother's house, my mom's mom, and she and the rest of my family were preparing for Thanksgiving dinner. Hello. Oh, hey, Carol, baby. How you doing? Uh, uh, hold on. Now, what y'all go sit your tails down somewhere? Y'all see I'm on this phone. Yes. Oh, well, you can come on over, but I'm not cooking that much. No. I just got some turkey, some honey ham, some fried chicken, some baked chicken, some pot roast, some collard greens, fat back macaroni and cheese. I got deviled eggs, candy yams. I got blueberry apple and sweet potato pie. Mm-hmm. Oh, hey. Let me call you back, my grandbaby here. Hey, grandma, baby. Oh, is he sick? <laughs> oh, did you check his temperature? That boy is running the fever. Go, you ain't good for nothing. Go in the kitchen, get that knife. We're going to slice up some, some taters and put it around his neck to drop the infection. And, and lather him up with some of this eucalyptus oil. And, and put that cold butter knife on his back. Now, grandma's remedies may have seemed strange, but they always worked. But my dad, he didn't know this. All he saw was his old up son in, in the kitchen full of food with the oven open with potatoes hanging around his neck. The only thing that was missing was the apple in his mouth. What, what the hell going on in here? Oh, hey, Junior, what, what's wrong with you? Now why y'all got my son look like he about to go in after the turkey is through? Oh, Junior, boy, them potatoes is just to draw out the infection. No, potatoes is for eating. I don't know what the hell y'all got going on in here. But give me my son. My dad picked me up and he saved me from the cannibals. And that's it. That's it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I lied. You go next. <laughs> okay, no, I'll go next. I'll go next. All right. Uh, um, my name is Suhaila Atar. Uh, I've been here since January of 98 and um, in Atlanta theater probably since 2000. The piece I'm going to do is a monologue from Third Country, which is a play that world premiered at Horizon Theater, I believe, in 2013. Do you know that ants, do you, they just naturally create community. Did you know that? They don't have brains, they're basically blind, they do it by smells and wandering around. Like, it's just like accidental order. They farm, create cities, have wars, recover, and keep building and doing it together. We, we, the higher species, with all our intellect and all our ability to see each other and attempt to ignore how each other smells, we can't even get someone across the street safely. We can't keep anyone safe, really. Our one task is to help people find a home, not just another place, another shelter, another job, a home, a community. This is not a community. This is just a territory. And that is not enough. I quit. Oh. 
Hello, I am Dana Stringer. I am a writer, playwright, poet, and a screenwriter. Tonight, I decided to read a piece of poetry, and it is titled, Hashtag Say Unnamed. We do not have the names for the unnamed. We hold only loss in the hollow of our bodies where language is lost, where deep tone groans conjure black apparitions, hauling vestiges of the drowning. A sack of saltwater soap bones shrouded in seaweed, a cracked skull grimed with sand grains, a pair of rusted shackles, a corroded neck yoke, a discolored loincloth, a blue shark tooth. We do not have the names for the unnamed. We have only a haunting of muffled voices muttering the moniker of a cargo ship making its way toward America. Mr. Riders, um, this is really hard for everybody. I think one of the ways that it's really hard on writers is that writers tend to gather places for yours and wine. And since we are here tonight and we're not all these, um, we can't kind of have those conversations um, that we often would have over some a glass of wine about our work. But I would love to start with a basic question. And, and that question is one from the beginning. Um, I think for all of us, there is a moment you were on the um, For me, that moment occurred um, when I was 11 years old. And my mother took me, raised me in the sun. They said, I think I gave you a message. I think I Technology is another reason that my life is face to face. But my mother took me. Negro ensemble um, who we raised in the sun, and I was in Detroit, and there was a big snowstorm, and the play was being put on in a high school auditorium, and we went over through the snow to this high school auditorium, and it was packed. And if you've ever been in a really cold climate, people have on a lot of clothes, and we were stuck into our seats in the theater with all of our clothes and all of our everything, and the heat was on, so it was not the most comfortable environment when the people came onto that street, every single person in that audience got cold, forgot to eat, got cold, we were melting, ice on them, we forgot all of that because the play is so wonderful that we all spent the next hour and a half eating the time pack and everything that was there. And I remember looking at all my neighbors when it was in a black high school and it was all black problems. And I remember looking at my neighbors thinking, we all got this because this is about us. This is our point us. This looks like our good problem on that. And I remember saying to my mother, when we got, this is what I want to do. And she said, because you're a great mother, then you should do it. And that's the moment when I knew it wasn't just that I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a speaker. I wanted my neighbors to see themselves and to hear themselves. And I wanted to be as the way that I would grow in my life. So I would love to know from you, because you're such wonderful writers, and it's really an honor to be here. Do you remember a moment when you realized that not only were you a writer, but you were a writer? Do you want me to go? Okay. Uh, I do remember the moment. I remember the moment vividly, uh, because I've, I've always been a storyteller. Um, and I used to put on plays with my family. I would cast my cousins. <laughs> At first, it was just me and my little sister, and my dad would be in the living room like, all right, come on, let's, let's go, let's go. But uh, I would put on Christmas plays with my family, and I remember one year, uh, I, I had done it two years in a row, and the second year, I said, you know, I'm going to charge this year. I'm going <laughs> to charge for the Christmas play. And I went to my next-door neighbor, Miss Kim, and she gave me a dollar to... Uh, to, to, to see my play. And I'm like, oh, I can make money from this. 
So that was the moment I was like, oh, I think I want to do this. I well, have a whole dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Miss Kim. So thank you, Miss Kim, for that dollar. Uh, I haven't made much more than that as a playwright <laughs> since, but you know, but but I I love the art, so that's that's my moment. <laughs> I think for uh, I think for me, I always say to people, I, if I had a superpower, it would be delayed reaction, girl. <laughs> so like, it takes me a while to catch up to what has actually happened, and I'm I'm always it's almost like cartoon physics. I'm on the other side before I know what was going on. <laughs> Um, so for you to ask me, when did you realize? I'm like, I don't know that I know yet, um, but I do know this is the only way I know how to communicate with storytelling, right? Um, I, I can go back to the first script that I ever wrote was 10th grade. The project was, um, we were, you know, those horrible times when you're given a group project. Mm -hmm. um, and it was about Lord of the Flies. And I was with all of these girls in this class and we didn't know what we were gonna do for the project. And I went, I have an idea. I'm just gonna write the story as if a whole bunch of girls were stuck on the island um, instead and what that story would look like instead. And you guys just sit off to the side, just let me do this. <laughs> and I wrote it and then gave them all their parts and that was it. And, I, and only you asking that reminds me of that, that this is the way I like to tell stories. It's just the natural way. I'm gonna reenact, I'm gonna give you the dialogue. That's why I know it's a playwright. Mm -hmm. Cool. I would have to say that um, it's, it's actually I credit a young lady, this was many years ago, I want to say maybe in the mid 90s. And I, uh, I was a member of a church and she was a pian pianist, but she also wrote um, pl plays. And it wasn't like your typical, you know, gospel play you know, that we're kind of accustomed to. It was they were really, really good and really we uh, well written. And I just remember just sitting and watching them and being so enthralled in that and just moved by it. And so I said, I think I can do that. I can do that too. And so I started just writing these little church skits that would like illustrate the sermons. And uh, lo and behold, one Sunday, the pastor allowed uh, a couple to perform one of my little skits. <laughs> and then after that, they were just like, Dana, you're really good. You should try to do this. You try to do this. And I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe maybe worth looking into. So that's kind of, I knew that I wanted to try this. I didn't know that I would be pursuing it as a career, but I definitely knew that um, I wanted to at least t uh, try my hand at it. I think that's what I No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say when you said pursuing it as a career, um, and sometimes I think we think of what we do as being a career because we have to figure out how to do it, you know, how to how to put on a play, how to do that. But it also is kind of a calling, um, I think, for many of us because we realize this is the only way we can do this. You know, this is the only way we can tell these stories. Um, I'm not seeing you all now, so I hope we're still good. Are we good? We're still here. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I think that that for a lot of us, it becomes even when we kind of think of it more practically, you know, and say, "Oh, I realized I could charge people to see this." Um, <laughs> that that's a very practical consideration. But there's a lot of ways that you can make a living. Um, <laughs> you know, and I think sometimes we try to pretend that we deny the mystical part of it. You know, where it's like we don't really know why we do this. We just love doing it. We love to tell stories out loud. And I, I like that, but love it's it. not really as much fun because you write it by yourself. People read it by themselves. And sometimes they'll invite you to a book club and that's always great. But in the theater, you write it and then it becomes a thing, a living, breathing thing where other people have to be there. You know, we can't do our work by ourselves. Even if it's a one person show, you have to have other people you know, working with you. And even if you do it all by yourself and set up the stage and do the lights and all the things that we have all learned how to do as working playwrights, um, even when you do that, the thing is that it doesn't complete itself. It's not done until you invite the audience in. Mm -hmm. And I'm always um, amused by the fact that we um, really, we love rehearsal. I think all of us love rehearsal. And that's because, you know, it's just us then that it doesn't get done. It's not finished until we kind of have to come out of the rehearsal hall and invite a bunch of people in and say, okay, what do you all think? You know, mm -hmm. and I've had the experience, I'm sure you all have where you, everything goes great in rehearsal. We all laugh at the jokes, everything is great. And opening night, people didn't think it was funny. <laughs> so, oh my God, how do we fix that? You know, what do we do with that? But that's the risk that I think is part of why we love it, don't you? That, the, that you have to work it out in front of people. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
-hmm. It's definitely exposing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But in a good way, right? In a way that that feeds something. Um, you know that that you took over the project, Lord of the Flies. I love making that an all girls story. That's so fabulous to me. I must see that script. That's such a great <laughs> idea. But it's you know doing adaptations and doing um, one person shows and all that. But we still have that. Um, I think that moment of really trying to figure out how do we bring people into this story. Mm -hmm. You know how do we how do we allow them in from the the stories you know making our poor cousins suffer through. I used to cast my cousins all the time, you know, and make them do stuff at Christmas, make them do stuff and all of that. But it really, I think, is something that we that we come here with, don't you? Because you could have written, you could have said, I'm a writer, I'm going to write novels, I'm going to write poems, I'm going to write essays. But, you know, we pick the one that makes people shake their heads and say, are you crazy? Yeah. You, can't, you can't make a living at that. And it's like, well, we'll figure that part out. But the first thing is we want to do it, do it. Absolutely. And you want to, and you want to do it well. You don't want to just do it. You want to do it well. And so the drive is you. I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's like, oh, that's right. I do need money. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. um, I just wanted it to be better. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and and it's. Um, but I think it's. It's. I don't. When you say we enjoy it, I'm just like I'm scared <laughs> every time yeah. it goes up. Mm -hmm. And then I'm glad to watch it because then I get to learn. And it's sometimes painless learning, which is not something that I get very often. So that's why I think I might love it. Yeah. For me, I think it, it's something that I, I have to do because if it's my only way of understanding the world. Yeah. You know, when I'm, when I'm lost and I don't know what to do or where to turn, I'm like, I, I have to write. <laughs> and I, I write plays. So I'm like, okay, now I, I just feel like I'm, I'm able to breathe after, you know, there's nothing like writing the end or end of play is nothing like that feeling, you know, it's just like, ah, that's done. You know, you, you feel like you can breathe. So, yeah. Yeah. And for me, the characters, the characters and the stories come to me. And I know you guys are probably familiar, maybe familiar with Jericho Brown, mm -hmm. who is, a, uh, he just recently won the uh, Pulitzer Prize, mm -hmm. uh, I think either last year. But I remember him saying that we have a responsibility to write the poems that we've been given to write. And I feel that with plays too, it's mm -hmm. like, when these stories come to me and these, I can't ignore them. I have to, I got to get them on the page. I got to let them tell their story and they don't leave me. I can ignore them and figure out something else to do all day long and get distracted with stuff, but they're still there calling me, calling mm -hmm. me to the page. And, and I, and, and it's almost like I am alive when I get there and as a story writer, it's like all of me is there. Mm -hmm. Every part of who I am is right there in that moment. And that's what I love about it. That's why I feel like it just, it's a thing that just, I feel whole in, when I'm practicing my art in that film. You ever have those moments when you finished a really big project that was so hard, you thought you'd never get through it and you did get through it when you say, okay, I'm not gonna write for a minute. I'm just gonna take a minute and just take my breath, catch a breath. And then you say, ooh, that was two weeks. I can't, you know, I, I can't, I can't not go longer because I feel the same way that it's like, that's the way I understand the world. And even though I'm always making big pronouncements about, okay, now I'm gonna take six months and not write anything, that never has lasted more than two weeks. I can't do it because otherwise I'm like walking through the world saying, what the hell, what is going on? How does, what does that sound like? How do I make sense of that? And I think especially now, in the midst of a pandemic like this, does your work help you understand this moment or have you found this moment stifling um, just in terms of your own creativity? Uh, for me, I, I, I haven't found the moment stifling. I've, I've actually found it liberating because uh, I didn't have to, to, to focus on it as much. You know, um, this is, this is the first, I actually wanted to cry coming, coming on the stage. I didn't do it, you know, I didn't cry. But I wanted to, because this is the first time I've been on the stage since March. And in my adult life, I've never been outside of the theater this long, you yeah. know. Uh, but just to, to be able to take a break, you know, because I would have never given myself this break, to be able to take this break and like, all right, I don't have to worry about that. And now I'm still writing, but it's, 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 feels different because theaters aren't open. You know, it's, it's been, it's been, um, it's been a blessing in disguise, you know. I Do you feel I, more uh, a responsibility to, um, to talk about community and to talk about 
um, the stressful situation that we're in now because it is such a terrible situation because we do have you know, the pandemic to deal with. We do have so many racial divisions and craziness um, to deal with because we have all of the things that are going on politically um, at this moment. Do you feel more of a responsibility to connect in a direct way uh, to what people need to hear uh, rather than what you may be wanting to write as an individual artist? I, I do, I do. Uh, and I feel the responsibility to to find the joy in it now. Like my, my focus is joy. There's a, there's a lot of pain happening. So it's, it's cool that I'm here and True Colors is doing joy and pain because now it's like my focus is finding that joy even in the midst of the pain because we need that. I think that's, that's uh, we have to be able to laugh through this because if not, you know, we just, we'll, we'll die from crying. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, finding the joy in, in this moment. Mm -hmm. Speaking of breaks, we're going to take a quick one. Uh, this is good. This is getting really good, and I hope you all are enjoying the conversation. And we are going to return after a very brief moment. first community conversation of our joy and pain season at Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater Company. What was the moment you recognized like, oh, I got this? It's not a day that goes by that I, that I don't get to see a young person that I developed and that is doing their thing in this industry. But the, um, but the payoff is the show. The payoff is we get to show the world our art. Yeah. And, and that's the difference between an artist and sometimes a celebrity. Welcome back. Uh, we'll continue our conversation with our wonderful panelists, and we hope that you will continue to stay tuned and enjoy. Don't Thank take you. it away. Thank you. I think, I think in this moment, I've been fortunate over the last eight months because I had the privilege of actually having these commissions of short work, so it's actually forced me to write. It's like it's different when you like you know, negotiate it and you're doing a contract and you have a deadline, you have to write. There's <laughs> no, you can't just kind of get distracted and, and not and put it to the side. So it's actually been a good thing in the sense that it has actually forced me to write. Uh, and those issues have been around racial injustice. So it's caused me to actually focus in with a sense of urgency and a, respon and a, and a responsibility to write about that. Um, and, uh, but otherwise I feel like if I had not had that, uh, those obligations, uh, I may have been a little stifled because it's a little overwhelming, just the, the craziness that's going on. It, it can be overwhelming. Uh, I go, there's roller coasters of emotions. Some days, it's, you know, it's joy. Some days, it's kind of like disappointment, like, what is this world coming to? But I, I am grateful that, that I have been, over the past eight months, have been able to consistently write because of the obligation of it, but also for the love of it. But, um, yeah, it, it's just kept me in that, you know, keeping the wheels churning because of that. I mean, that's what I was, I was going to say is uh, I hide from writing. It takes me a really long time. Um, and so deadlines, deadlines are like, that's, I'm cleaning the house and then, you know, going shopping and then have to help other people until that deadline is right on top of me. And then I write. And then when I start writing, I disappear, you know, and the time I can't feel it. Um, and I've had a couple of deadlines, this, you know, this during this pandemic, which I was grateful for because without it, it's overwhelming. They're too big. The stories are too big. I can't control them. Um, but the stuff that I was writing about is all uh, fantastical. Mm -hmm. It's otherworldly. It's, you know, that's exact. I, it wasn't supposed to be. It was supposed to be focusing on the idea of being stuck at home or dealing with these things or whatever. But I found that my brain wanted to go to the ethereal and wanted mm -hmm. to go to magic and wanted to go there. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, those are the stories I told. It's really interesting that all of us who, like playwrights around the world, 
we're always longing for commissions, we're always longing for being produced, we're always longing for those deadlines because we know that means that the play is moving ahead. And listening to you describe um, the, that it's kind of been liberating with this pandemic is really wonderful because I felt it too, where it's just kind of like, okay, everything is different. You know, you're not trying to write something because you know you've got a show scheduled because they're going to open it in a theater. You know, we, we can't open in the theater. So it's like, okay, am I writing things that are going to be postponed until later? Am I going to try to write things that actually can be done now? Can I work outside? You know, what would it be like to have a play where everybody was, you know, outside or in a tree or in a park or whatever? But it, it actually has been very liberating, I think, for me, just in terms of thinking about what do I want to do? What do I want to say without feeling like I owe it to anybody in advance, which is a, a blessing um, to know that it's you're writing for a commission or for something in advance. But it's also liberating to just be um, in one of those moments where you're looking out the window and just saying, I wonder what's going to come to me. I wonder what I'm thinking about and let yourself really, really do it, which I think is a real um, joy of what we do. And the, the whole idea of joy and pain you know, I think is so intertwined in what we do because there's the joyful moments when the writing comes to us or the characters reveal themselves. And then there's the pain of actually having to stop talking about it and put it on paper and all of that mm -hmm. hard stuff um, that we do. But I, I do think it's that, it's that balance and the joy is always greater, don't you think? Or we wouldn't keep doing it. We're not masochists. You know, we, we don't want to necessarily <laughs> suffer, do we? <laughs> Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, are we? Are we? But yeah. Okay. <laughs> a little suffering, right? Yeah. A little suffering. A little suffering. It's funny. I um, had a conversation with Tanache uh, J. C. Bolden um, a while ago, and we were talking about. She was talking about. Uh, she mentioned the white gaze, and I had been reading all of these things in the New York Times about, you know, playwrights of color talking about the white gaze. Um, and I wondered if that's something that you all think about, that you identify as something that is a thing that you have to think about and confront um, in deciding what kind of work that you do. Going with you, Paris. Going oh, with me. <laughs> um, it, it is something that I that I think you have to think about. Uh, recently, I, I, I did an, an online uh, play. It's not a play, but we're going to call it an online play. And it was reviewed by uh, um, white men, you know. So even, even that, it, I, I feel like they're, they're seeing my work through a white gaze. And this work was, was, was celebrating black women and uh, black women coming into their power and not having to uh, ask for power. And, and the very, well, I don't want to give away the play because it's streaming now. Uh, <laughs> but this, 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 this character comes into, in, into power and one of the reviewers who, uh, you know, I know him, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, a, a white man and he, he thought that the, the ending was sad. And I laughed for about two minutes. I'm like, wait a second, this woman comes into her power and you think, you think this is sad? I, and it, it was just, to answer your question, I'm trying to get away from the white gaze. <laughs> I'm, trying to not, I'm, I'm trying to not make it a thing uh, and, and, and not read the reviews and, and things like that. Uh, but I, 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 think it's, I think it's present, you know? Uh, and I just want to run away from it. Yeah. 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 I don't, I'm, I feel like I'm an enabler to it. Yeah. Mm. I think I'm an, an enabler to it. I think, mm. I think I get really, to be included uh, in the label, I'm going to get emotional, to be included mm. on the label of BIPOC uh, makes me afraid in the sense of, I don't know that I have the right considering where I have sat in my career. Mm. Um, I, I think I have, always been easy on the eyes mm -hmm. for the gates. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, I, I am your, I am your access drug, you know, I'm the gateway drug for maybe a, a different kind of thing. And I, and that's my only response to it is I, I think I enable that idea mm -hmm. and I don't know how else to respond to that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. For me, I want to say that 
I don't want to sound like, oh, I don't care. But I really, I really don't take that into consideration. I think I have a commitment and a conviction for the black experience that it doesn't matter what they think about it. If they, if they get it or don't, if they, if they don't get it, I move on. But it really, it really hasn't mattered to me. I, I haven't filtered it through what are they going to think of this? Are they going to get it? Are they going to uh, uh, demean it or reject it or ridicule it? I, I honestly have, and I, and, I, and I think that's a blessing, and, and strangely, I'm, I'm actually like, it feels kind of odd not to be concerned about it, because I know we talk so much about it, and I know it, it is a thing, but I just haven't made that, it's just not a focus of when I'm writing. I don't, I don't think about trying to appeal and make sure I adapt it according to their taste and to their expectations or their standards. I just, I just don't. And I find that liberating as well. As it, you should. it is. Yeah. And, as you should. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm definitely not concerned about it. I just I, I think it exists, you know. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? But oh, it, yeah. it doesn't concern me. I fall uh, into the habit of um being exotic exoticized. Oh mm-hmm. does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah. It does. Um and I think I that's been that's such a habit. It's been a habit for a long time that the first time this year. I got to work with somebody who was of my culture, like who was Muslim and from the Middle East and all of the things. And I would share ideas with her and she wasn't amazed. (laughs) She was like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And I was like, oh, this is what I have missed out on. (laughs) Oh, Oh, and that's where I had the awakening this year was because of that partnership, I went, I've been falling for the the people that are like, that's amazing. Your family did that. And mm-hmm. it's like, okay, oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Side of Detroit it always teases me and says, you know, you weren't really in America. Black West Side of um, and he was absolutely true. All black schools, all black churches, all the anybody that you needed, a lawyer, a doctor, whoever it was, it was an all-black universe, and we never perceived it as a problem. It wasn't like, oh, my God, it's an all-black universe. There's no white people here. There's, you know, this is what was me. It was like we're living full lives. And there was no white gays because there were no white people. Right. You know, the gays, about where the gays of the other Negroes in my neighborhood, you know, what are the, what are these people going to think about? What are, what are these going to think about? But not so that when I started talking to these um, young artists of color about the weight of that gaze and the weight of feeling like always having to explain to white people, what do you mean when you say that? What does it mean that your family did these things as opposed to another person of your same culture who would say, girl, I know exactly what you're talking about. You don't have to explain a thing. And that's, that's I think, the space that I've always been able to work in. And I, I praise and thank and consider a blessing the universe of Black theaters who supported my work my whole professional life. When I landed at the Alliance Theater and some people discovered me at the Alliance Theater and I said, no, no, I'm not a new playwright. I've been working professionally in, for 20 years in a universe of playwrights that you are, of, of theaters that you all may never have heard of, but are vibrant. They kept me alive. They brought me in front of audiences that I was writing for. So it never seemed like, oh my God, I might not get to Broadway. I might not get to the regional theater universe. I might not. Because every kind of theater, every kind of cultural institution that I needed was present in the black community. So that it, it never felt like I had to figure out what white people wanted. You know, I wanted to figure out what I wanted to say to black people. Mm-hmm. And it is very liberating because it doesn't require you to explain everything. It doesn't require that apology. And it also doesn't require you to always have to write about what they are thinking about and mm-hmm. what we're thinking about then. You know, I had a long conversation with a white critic one time who said, do you ever think about putting white people in your work? (laughs) And I said, I don't think about my work that way. If I'm writing a story and some white people are in it, they're in that play, they're on that (laughs) stage. But if I'm writing a story where there's no white people in it, I don't say to myself, damn, I better put some white folks in here. (laughs) Any more than I say, I really need some Koreans in here. You know, and I have no problem with white folks, Koreans, anybody, but... They have to occur naturally in the story. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that's what that, why that white gaze is so destructive. 
because if, if, if you're coming through that, you end up with that feeling of, I better put a white character in because they need to see themselves in a play. And if they don't, they can't feel welcomed into the play. And we learn how to do that as people who are non-white in America. We learn how to do that the moment we pick up a book or go to a play. We know how to identify with people who are not necessarily black people. But many people don't know how to do that in the United States, and they're kind of shocked. Like, oh my God, there's all Chinese people in this play. Can it, can it possibly relate to me? You know, rather than saying, it's a play about human beings. Mm -hmm. There's a way in for you. Mm -hmm. Relax. You can do it. We're all telling the same story. Love stories, war stories, you know, um, all of those family stories. And they're all the same wherever we go. But if we, if we end up trying to twist the story to include someone who's going to judge it and decide who gets produced and who doesn't, who gets to Broadway, if that's important, and who doesn't, it starts twisting the work that we do. And I think it's so um, important to have institutions like True Colors and to have institutions that are, are dedicated to making the voices of, of artists of color nurture those voices in a setting where you don't have to explain, you don't have to, to say, no, this is what we put in our green. No, this is how we like to cook our rice, you know, to where everybody already knows. And then if you include others, they have to go figure that out. Ask somebody else from that culture and say, what did she mean when she said that about mm -hmm. the collard greens? You know, what did they mean when they started talking about this or that? And then you get to have a conversation rather than explain in the play. Mm -hmm. I'm not explaining in the play. tell them this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She froze, but w while she's frozen, I... <laughs> I can uh, I can talk about that because recently I, w I was writing a play. I, I got a commission uh, and there were white characters in, in this play because um, the lady who commissioned me, she wanted to be in it. She knows my work. She's like, oh, I would love to be in your play. I was like, OK, great. I'm going to I'm going to write this play for you. In the first draft, I had a joke about uh, CP, CPT uh, <laughs> and and she she uh, told me uh, she like, you know, when my husband and I, we got to that part, we didn't know what it, what it meant. So uh, if you could just explain that. And I'm like, no, I, I'm not going to explain it. And she said that, uh, well, I think, you know, the audience, you know, they may not get it and they, it may take them out of the play. And I'm like, but I, I'm not writing for the white audience. So this is, I, I had to explain. I'm like, I'm not writing, I'm not writing so you can get it. If you want to get it, Ask someone, ask me what it means, but, I, I, but I'm not writing, you know, for you. I, I can't do that as a black man. I can't write for, you know, uh, you, you know. It's not an educational play. Yeah, exactly. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. was a white woman in New York. He said, what does that mean? The kitchen. And I said, wow, you know, that's really interesting. It's like, <laughs> you know this? I said, oh, black women know this is kitchen. So she said, well, you need to explain that. I said, no, because it would make you feel better. But every black woman I know who picked up this book would say, who is Pearl talking to? Yeah. <laughs> She's trying to tell us what the kitchen is. And I'm not having it. I'm not going to have them say to me, who were you talking to? Did you not think we knew? No. You have to you have to just not do that over explaining because it takes the it takes yeah. the fun out of it. You know, we're talking yeah. about joy and pain. The joy in storytelling is telling the story. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not explaining, explaining, explaining. It's like, no, that's no fun. That's yeah. no fun. Go get a book. Yeah. Go get another book. I think that's why I've started to find myself being drawn to supernatural ideas. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is, is you can pull from anything. The myth mm -hmm. and the lore exists in everything. Mm -hmm. And if you want to blend it, that's fine. The, the last full script that I wrote was all immersed in Islamic tradition, but mm -hmm. I didn't have to explain any of it. Mm -hmm. Because all I had to do was just tell the story that I wanted to tell because mm -hmm. that's all that mattered to me. Um, and that was that was the most freeing. So yeah, I think that's why I like staying there. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I think that you know, and, and when I when I think about um, my plays and the audience I'm writing for, I want you know the black people to come in and and 
be able to feel the joy of being able to relate to what, what has lifted our spirits through the years, through hardship, whether that's dance, music, food, spirituality, friendships, humor, um, the, things that, the things that we all identify with. I think that that is a source of joy for us, and I think that's what they long to see on the stage, is they long to see something that, uh, you know, yes, there's conflict, there's drama, but we also want to see our culture mm-hmm. and, and the things that have, like I said, have, have always uh, been the source and the, and the foundation of our, of our joy. Story, don't you? You want that joy that the culture has given us over time. So it's a, it's, um, it's acceptable, and I think sometimes we forget that we're allowed the pleasure of the writing, you know, because we're working so hard to do it and working so hard to explain it. That the, that part of I think why we stick with it. I know part of the reason that I have stuck with it and can't imagine doing anything else is because of the absolute pleasure um, in doing it, along with the terror along with the craziness, <laughs> along with the guilt, along with the, with the denial, along with all of those other things we don't talk about. But all of that stuff. But the, the other thing is the, is the absolute joy. What are you all looking at or listening to now, like in the popular culture, that is, is interesting to you? Is there anything that, that has been um, come past your scan lately, writing or music or whatever, where you said, wow, that's... That's an interesting artist. I'm interested in what that woman is doing. I'm interested in what that, mm. that guy is doing. Uh, Kendrick Lamar always. He's, he's, <laughs> he's a huge inspiration for me. I love Kendrick Lamar. But uh, lately, uh, Leon Bridges. I love Leon Bridges. And um, Old Dominion. It's a, it's a country group. I was in an Uber one day, and this song came on. I'm like, what is that? And I shazammed it, and... I love this country group. It's called Old Dominion. So yeah, they're bringing me a lot of joy. Yeah, and always musicals, always musicals. Really? Always musicals. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I've actually gone back to old music, to mm-hmm. music from like the '80s and and the and the '90s for me. And if it comes to stories, I am really drawn to a podcast called Spooked which uh, gets real people to tell ghost stories, oh, wow. like that they've experienced. And for some reason, I'm just hooked on that. Yeah. I've, I've literally gone further back in terms of I've been listening to modern jazz artists, and I never yeah. in my life thought I would be like, like longing for that and desiring to hear that daily. I've been listening to Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, Dizzy Gillespie, wow. Ella Fitzgerald. And it's, I just think about the music. You can tell that they were longing for the freedom and the equality, and, and, and it comes through the music that that was their way of escaping. Because I feel so free and light when I'm hearing these songs, and I've just been, and it brings me, it's been bringing me so much joy just to kind of lay it in the bed at night and just turn that on and just let it play. And I'm just like, this this music is beautiful, and I never would have thought I would have been listening uh, to those to those artists. <laughs> no, I'm I'm saying, saying, you, know, know. you know. No, no, I'm just teasing because it's 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 true. Things, you know, when you, I realize that that what's going on, which was such an amazing thing from 1971, that album, that Marvin Gaye CD, that album is 50 years old. And I was talking to my husband about using it in a um, in a program in the Collision Project with. Um, uh, high school students, and I said, I bet these kids don't even know anything about what's going on. And my husband, let me go on and on like this for a minute. And he said, what was the music um, that was 50 years before that? When you were listening to what's going on when it came out in 1971, what was the music that was 50 yes. years ago that you paid attention to? And I said, oh. <laughs> and he said, rag time. Were you paying any attention to that? No. That seemed like the oldest thing in the world. So don't approach it with these kids like, Y'all should know this. This is a classic. Of course, you want them to know it, mm-hmm. but introduce it to them yeah. in a way yeah. that allows them in, rather than saying you should know it. And when he said that about ragtime, I said, "Wow, that's that's to think 1921. That's what they were listening to." Then 50 years later, I'm in Detroit in Atlanta listening to Motown, and it's like I wasn't thinking about Scott Joplin at all. Yeah, <laughs> you know, all I was I was trying to figure out what Marvin Gaye was talking about. Mm-hmm. But I think it's it's part of the the. The thing that's so interesting to be able to do this time and just being able to live over time is that you can really get a, um, a much less frantic idea 
about how fast things have to move and how slow they have to move um, and how we can approach them. Because I think I used to be a lot less patient with how long it takes people to understand something, you know, because I was really thinking I understood a lot more. And then when I realized that it isn't just that it takes people a long time to understand stuff, it takes me a long time to understand stuff. You know, and it's like everything new. If you keep asking yourself the real questions, there's always new answers. We're all going to have new answers and new questions on the other side of this pandemic. You know, when we all get to be together next Thanksgiving, when we all get to be together next holiday, next year, when we get to dance and talk about inaugurations and all of that stuff, that I think we'll have a whole series of new questions to ask ourselves about what is the, you know, what, what is, what is community? You know, what does it mean to take care of each other? Because those questions are going to be, I think, more present for us this winter um, than they've been in many of our lives um, for a long time. You know, how do we take care of each other? How do we make community a real thing rather than just something that we say? And how does our writing fit into that, mm -hmm. into building those kinds of bonds between people? Do you feel like your writing is a part of building um, community or more um, something that manifests um, community? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not taking this one first. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question. That's not a test question, I swear. I'm really, I'm really asking that. <laughs> Will you repeat the question? Um, just, I was just thinking that sometimes I think when we think about our work coming from community and, and being something that shapes, is that how we see our, how we see your work as part of something that shapes community? Or actually people that community pulls a mirror up to that community so it's it's not really that they can't be both happening at the same time right. but it's a question of let me lead this audience or let me show this audience who they are and then they will find a way themselves which are and i'm i'm uh i don't think one is necessarily better than the other but they're a different approach to stories that's what i was, was my Asking initial about. reaction is that I feel like it's a trick question. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I because, swear it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, only because it's exactly what you said. It depends on what the work is, right? If it's commission, then you have a specific audience or you're answering to a specific request, right? And if you answer to that request, that's targeting. But if you're writing from something that came from you, wouldn't that be... You manifesting? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So wouldn't it depend on the situation or are you asking us overall or am I speaking for everybody and do I need to stop? <laughs> when you say target, when you like if it's a commissioning thing, just what do you mean when you say the target? The experience that I've had with commissions is when I'm working with a specific theater, I have somebody explain to me who their audience is and tells me that's what they need the story to be guided to, mm. right? They, that's, we need, this, my audience, mm. I will have, I will have the, the, the comment said to me, my audience will not get that. We have to adjust it. We have to adjust mm -hmm. it. So that's something different versus another commission, the, the last commission that I had, which was um, what I wanted to write. And that, man, I, I don't know that it manifested anything, but I, I mean, I guess it did because mm -hmm. it was about grief. So I think it manifested mm -hmm. that community. Mm -hmm. I would agree with, with you uh, when you said it, it depends on the work. Uh, specifically, uh, after the Trayvon Martin protest, uh, I was here in Atlanta and, and I went on this protest and I felt, I didn't feel fulfilled. It was like, there's something, there's something missing. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I do know what I have to do. I was going to say, I don't know what to do, but I'm like, no, there's something missing. And what was missing was the community. So I, I wrote two plays, uh, uh, Chains and Broken, that premiered here uh, to sold out audiences. Thank you. Uh, and it was very difficult to, to see. Uh, the, the stories were very difficult, but at the end, we had talkbacks and everyone stayed and everyone stood up and they, they talked about how they were feeling in this moment. And, and that was the moment I'm like, wow, this is, this started from a thought of like, I'm not fulfilled because I, we were, we were together, but I, I wanted to hear, you know, I wanted to hear 
how people were feeling in this moment. You know, we were marching and that was great, but I'm like, I want to know personally, how do you feel about what's going on? You know, uh, so in that aspect, I think that was a manifestation because I, I, wa- I wanted community yeah. and, I, and, I, and I brought the community to the theater so we could, uh, so we could talk about it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I'm, and I've been sitting here thinking, like, for me, I really, it may, it may sound impossible. I think it's a blend of both. I think that, I think for me, what we demonstrate on the stage is connection. We, all of these elements have got to work together. There's got to be compromise, flexibility, adaptability. There's got to be understanding. Everybody plays a part. You need the sound designer, a lighting designer. Everybody is connected for this bigger picture. And I think that I think that that helps to actually shape the community as well when they see these dynamics all playing together to create the whole. And so I think I think that's what I'm, I think that for me, that's, I hope I'm answering it correctly, but that's kind of how I, I kind of, I think it's a blend of both for me. People say, well, I understand you're writing this, but we need for, our audience won't get it, so you need to add this or subtract this. Is that difficult um, for you to do? I mean, didn't you guys just speak about this? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the idea of dealing with the gaze of having to adjust Mm -hmm. to make it easier for somebody to digest the situation? You end up doing bad writing when you do that Mm -hmm. because you're forced into exposition that doesn't even help the story. Mm -hmm. So, of course, what's what's the answer to that? How do you how do you not not how do you when you find yourself in that position? What's a strategy um, that can be applied so that it doesn't make you do bad writing so that it doesn't make you over explain? What strategies can we can we share with each other to say, okay, how do you how do you get around that when the person is the one who's commissioned they have commissioned you and and then feels that they have a certain ownership of how you approach the work? Are there any yeah, strategies say, that have worked for you? They know. It's like, no, this is, this is <laughs> I'm not, I don't Again, I don't write for, I, I'm writing, you came to me to, to write this piece and you, you, you have to trust me. And the audience will get it. Uh, the audience that I'm writing for will get it. Um, so I, that's, that's not something that I'm willing to do uh, when it's like, well, we, we don't get this or our audiences won't get it. I'm, I know a few people who will get it. So I, I would rather focus on the folks that I know will get it than trying to write for, for uh, to explain again, like we've been talking about. You know? I obviously don't have a strategy or I wouldn't be in those <laughs> situations. <laughs> I mean, I laugh about it, but it's, I, it's so I don't cry right now. Um, but it's, uh, I, my strategy, it's, it's only because I've been slowly waking up. And I think the strategy is to have confidence in your story. If you can't have confidence in yourself, at least have confidence in your story. And mm-hmm. if you defend that, I guess you'll be okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you will. Say amen and yes, you will. Because that's the thing that I, when you said that about um, them saying, okay, this, our audience won't get this, or someone saying to, to any of us, you know, you, they won't get this. It made me feel so protective um, of you all as writers um, because that's the, that's the way you end up with a story where you, you look at it and say, oh, that's not what I started off with. Yeah. And I, I remember having a terrible experience with a, a director when I was a very young uh, playwright. And he was from New York. Um, and he was a man. And he was middle-aged. And I was about maybe 30. Um, but I was, I was just starting to work um, in the theater uh, professionally. And he had all kinds of ideas for my play that were wrong. He had all kinds of ways he wanted to stage it, which were wrong. And I was too scared to tell him that because he was a big shot male director from New York. And I will never forget sitting in the back of the house on opening night and thinking to myself, I will never do this again. (laughs) I don't care if I have to produce myself every play I write. I will never do this again because I hated it. It was like I wanted to run out of the theater or stay there at the door and apologize to people and say, I'm yeah. so sorry. This is not what I had in mind. I was a fool. Please forgive me and come back one more time. Yeah. But it's that, that moment of realizing that when you think you're giving in because they know more and then you see it and you realize they can't possibly know more, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, because it's you. It came out of your heart. It came out of your head. It came out of all the experiences that we've had 
um, you know, that make us, in a, even in a demonstration, you're walking through the crowd and you're thinking to yourself, I wonder what the individual story, I wonder what that man is thinking. I wonder what that woman is thinking. I wonder what it feels like to be that little kid, you know, whose mother is, is dragging them down the street because she wanted them to be in a demonstration. Because we have so much stimulus, I think, sometimes coming in um, when it's like a big crowd like that, that as writers, we're like, okay, great, fine, good energy, but let me pick one story and see if I can tell that. Let me make two of these characters, see if they can talk to each other. Um, even in the same setting, you know, let me walk them down the street. What are they talking about? And it's, I know I used to drive my daughter crazy walking through the malls. When she was a big shopper, I wasn't big on shopping, but she's a kid. I'll go where she wants to go. And I would be making up stories as we yeah. walked around Linux Square. I wonder what that guy is talking about to that woman. And I wonder, I wonder if she said, Mom, I'm trying to buy shoes. We are not trying to write plays in here. We're just trying to buy shoes. But I think that we are always writing. Yeah. You know, we're always listening. Aren't you always listening for dialogue? Yeah. Oh, yes. you, do you write it down? I know you all have phones and stuff. You all have yeah. different stuff, so you don't scribble stuff on those sheets of paper, or do you? Do you write down scraps I usually, that you hear? I, I, it's a combination. It's sticky, sticky notes, notebooks, a cell phone when I'm thinking about a character's name will come to me that's unique, and then a line will come. And I'm, yeah, it's I've, I've got a whole bunch napkins of, even. I've got a whole bunch of voice <laughs> memos, texts, oh, and uh, emails, and also postcards and oh, yeah. post-it notes and napkins. Yeah. <laughs> something, <laughs> that, something that I learned about myself this year is I turned everything into a story, like you were saying, and I was like, wow, I, I, I think in stories. And any time yes. something is happening, I'm like, oh, that would be a good story. Yeah. Oh, that's a good story. Oh, and I'm, I'm, it's, part of me is trying to turn that off. It's like, wait a second. But do you ever catch yourself, do you ever catch yourself and go, nope, that's a concept. Yeah. That's not a story. Yeah, that's yeah. a story. Yeah. That's a concept. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But it's just it's just amazing just to walk around the world and someone can tell me something and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to write yes. the hell out of it. <laughs> yeah, keep talking, you know. I love that. <laughs> my friends used to say that I was a gossip uh -huh. and it made me really ashamed. And then finally a friend of mine a few years ago was like, it's not that you're a gossip. It's that you love stories so much. Mm -hmm. You want everybody to hear everybody else's story. Yeah. You have to stop. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going to make a teacher say, can I use that? Because I, I'm like, wait, can, oh, can, I can I use that? <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah, can I use can that? I use yeah. That? Yeah. <laughs> um. yeah. 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 All the time. <laughs> You said it to me too late, but it's. I think that's part of the the, the path that you have to make. Because if you if you don't honor that when your friends and your family say don't write about that because the story's too rich and you sneak and try to write about it, they'll always know it's them. You know, and it's like I love the work that we do, but you know I don't want to lose my my loved ones because they come to the theater mm -hmm. and say I told her not to use that, and even though she changed the name. <laughs> That is so me, and my <laughs> people will know that's me, so I try very hard not to do that. But sometimes I go back and check with the person and say, it's been a couple of years, you remember that thing? You know, and I use it now. I mean, you don't care about him anymore now, I, right? I can write about this moment that y'all had. But it's it's like balancing that that thing that we do, which is always looking for a story, yeah. always looking for a story. Yeah. And it, it's like it hits your ear differently, or a character. I always start with characters. If I'm horrible plot. I hate plot. I just like to make people talk. <laughs> That's what Kenny Leon used to tease me because I would be like, Kenny, if it was up to me, everybody would have on a black turtleneck and on the front of the stage and talk. They wouldn't move around and all that stuff. And he said, no, no, we don't do that in the theater. We're going to do this and this. But it's, I don't see the picture as much as I hear what they're saying. Yeah, right. Which Same. is why yeah. I love a director who can make pictures with me. Because I don't, I don't write that way. I, I really am much more attuned to what people are saying, mm -hmm. yeah. so that it's, it's always a joy to me when a director will have a picture that comes to them, um, you know, that that didn't occur to me just because that's not the way my mind works. Right, right. I actually think that's a blessing. Pearl, I'm gonna. Do you want me? I'm, Listen, are you Are you I, okay? I could, we could go on. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, but the only reason I'm stopping is because Clarissa is like lording over us. <laughs> well, no, not necessarily. <laughs> Listen, we could we could keep this going um, all night. We do have a few couple of a few questions from our audience members that we wanted to ask. Okay. But, um, do you want to finish your thought and then we can get into that? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
No. So this is this is um, this has been really great, and and obviously, you know, we are trying some things out and doing what we can to make sure that we are sharing um, your voices with our community and continuing to produce during this this unique time. Um, so we're so appreciative of the conversation that's been happening this evening, um, and we're going to roll into our audience Q&A questions. And I'm going to start with asking you all, uh, in line with our joy and pain uh, theme for this, this year, what are some new rituals that you have developed during this time to care for and cultivate um, joy? for your spirit and your well-being as an artist. I don't think we talk enough about self-care as an artist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so what's, what's, what's been happening in that? Do you want to start with Pearl? Yeah, Pearl, would you like to kick us off? Yeah. Did you hear that question? Um, I think the most important thing um, that I've been doing um, is making sure that I go outside um, every morning, um, that I go outside, my husband and I, have a have a very old dog so he walks really slow so we take him up to the park and we and we walk outside and I try to look at the sky I try to look at the birds um, I try to be grateful I live in southwest Atlanta I try to be grateful for the change that has occurred because the park John A. White Park where I'm walking was a confederate battleground yeah. so it's like I look at that sky and I say to myself okay even on days when I think everything is terrible the sky is beautiful, there's birds out here, and there used to be a Confederate battleground here. Mm. And now I'm a free woman walking through the world under the blue sky. So I try to consciously do it every morning so I'll feel better. Um, and the days I don't do it, I really start feeling myself just, you know, um, reacting more to the bad things than I am to the good things. So walking outside, looking at the sky is a big piece for me. Paris? Uh... I think for me, I actually recently, uh, I turned 37 on October 27th. Baby. And, <laughs> and, um, and I told myself that, you, you know, I'm going to do something every day to love myself. I'm, I'm going to make sure I do something every day to say, you know what? I'm loving myself. I'm going I'm to do this. So uh, recently, it's, it's really been, been breathing. <laughs> I've, I've just been breathing, you know, and, and, and focusing on my breath, because I was talking about this with uh, Jamil, that, you know, we, we go through the world and we forget that we're breathing. You know, it's, it's just like, it's just something we don't, we don't focus on. So now I just take time to like, wait a second, I'm here, I'm, I'm breathing. And it's, it's, that's an amazing thing. And it's bringing me so much joy just to sit back and say, wait, okay, I'm here, I'm, I'm on a stage now, I love this. I'm with you all, oh, I'm with, me. oh. <laughs> I'm here, you know, and that just brings me joy just to take the time to just to see where I am and just breathe in the moment, you know. I think I'm the combination of both of you. It's it's being outside mm -hmm. and uh and um breathing and yoga. Mm -hmm. That's that's the stuff that when I start to get overwhelmed, I have to remind myself I haven't left the house today. I didn't go for my walk. I didn't do my workout. I didn't do this, so you have to go do it. Your brain is not focused. And so that's what I do for self-care. And bath salts. <laughs> um, for me, it's, it's a combination of uh, practicing solitude. I think it keeps me centered. Um, and in that solitude, it may result into prayer, meditation, even writing. Because it's, you know, it's my sacred, my sacred space. And it always brings me joy uh, when I feel like I'm expressing myself just freely. Um, and then back to the, just the, uh, this jazz, modern jazz is just my thing now. And it has been making me so happy. Uh, so those are kind of the same, some of the things that I practice to find joy in these, in these chaotic times. And I will add, um, we just moved. We moved during a pandemic year because I oh, mean, wow. why not? <laughs> um, uh, and so I, I feel really happy when we talk to our neighbors, mm -hmm. when we talk to our neighbors. Like to just have them across the street and like talk and their dog runs over. That makes me really happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had someone ask a question. Um, they said that they have a lot of ideas and they wanted to know um, how to introduce their thoughts to the page. So curious about what uh, suggestions or maybe even more rituals that you may have around how uh, artists can just get started in, in doing that and getting those ideas out. They, they answered their own question with the question. He said, 
I, 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 want to, I have a lot of ideas and I'm curious about how to get them on the page. That's your answer. Get them on the page. Yeah, you know, don't get, try to get, order them. Yeah, get them out of your head. Mm-hmm. Just, just, start, just start writing. The, the hardest thing as a playwright is writing plays. It's like just, just starting. Just start. For me, it's always been yes. just starting. Yes. You know? But once I start, it's like, oh, oh, I do know how to do this. Okay, let's, let's go. Let's go. I can do this. But just getting into the, the mode of starting. You know, we, we spend so much time here, but it's like, just get yourself out of that. Just start, you know, just just start with maybe a title, you maybe the character's name. Just just start. And then you you just you just go. You know? he, he, that remind, I had a playwriting student one time. I'm, I'm, I would do playwright residencies and I work in the high schools. And I remember everybody else was writing and this one student wasn't. And I said, what are you doing? And he, you, you need to start writing your script. And he goes, I have it all in my head. And I went. That's not a play. Those are thoughts. Yeah. I need you to get on the, yeah. on the page. And, uh, and I think the biggest thing that I tell my students is stop trying to make it perfect. Mm-hmm. Right. It's going to be oh, bad. There's no such, there's no it's going to be bad, but you got to get it out mm-hmm. because editing will make it better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be awesome. Yeah. I want to say some of the stuff I started writing early on, I pray never sees the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like just horrible. We all do, I think. But I had to start. And sometimes it's just like, I want this story to be about blah, 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 and just write it all down. I, w- I, want, some, I want this to happen. What do I want to happen in this story? Blah, 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 blah. And, and not too long ago, I actually started a thing where I felt like I wrote 10-minute plays so much better than a full length. Mm-hmm. And so now, if I have to write a full length, I'll just treat every scene like a little short play. Mm-hmm. And it's like a little bit at a time, and it, it just builds up to this thing. And even if some of the stuff doesn't flow together, it's not cohesive, I can always go back and revise it. So even if, if, the, even if uh, that person that asked the question, just start with a short play and just mm-hmm. write a story or a little skit and then write something else that you can kind of connect with that. So Right, and, and even if you just have lines of dialogue and it's only two, mm-hmm. like it's a question and then response, write that down in a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. If it's the name of the character, write right. that down. Yeah. If you only have this, yeah. write that down. Mm-hmm. Don't try to make them all in order now. You'll see it after you get all the pieces. Yeah. And, and writers understand this more than anyone, I, I think. It's like you, you can't control it. You, you, can, you can know the story and know everything about mm-hmm. it, but when those characters start talking, they take listen control. to the characters. You know, the yeah. characters are going to tell you. There's been many times where I've been fighting with the characters in my head, like, <laughs> no, I want you to go. And the characters are like, no, right. no, 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 I want to go over here because it won't make sense. And I'm like, yes, it will. But as soon as I listen to the characters and I, just, and I let them do the talking, I'm like, okay, yeah. all right, then it, then it flows. But as soon as I get in my head, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm mm-hmm, writing about. Mm-hmm. And the character's like, well, I told you if you'd listen to me, then you, you know. <laughs> have you ever gotten bored while you're writing and you're like, well, this is bad. It's, yeah. I'm like, yeah, no, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what, I, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I Pearl, <laughs> how do you know the difference? Oh, Pearl, mm-hmm. yes. Do you have any advice? I would say the, the thing that's the most helpful for me is, is uh, keeping journals. I've been an obsessive journal keeper since I was like 11 years old. And I... I don't try to do, I have friends who keep journals who want them to be perfect so that when someone finds them in a hundred years, they'll say, oh my God, this was a genius. We should have treated this one. I keep saying, don't worry about what's going to happen and who's going to find your trunk with all this stuff in a hundred years. Use it now. So that I I think of my journal as like um, playing scales, musicians playing scales or a, a ballet dancer, a dancer of any kind going to class every day because it's almost like just making sure that you keep that muscle yeah. um, working. What did I hear today? What did I see today? Um, how did I feel about it? And just to write it down. And my, my journals are, are often entries that start with a lot of whining about something or another. Don't want to go to the grocery store. Don't want to do this. Don't want to <laughs> do that. And then if I just make myself sit there and, and continue the whining, eventually it dies down and you start thinking about something else. But what about what I saw yesterday? What about that idea? I had, but it's like you first have to trick yourself into sitting down and picking up the pen and, and writing on the paper. And journals are, are really good for that. They're also good for snippets of things, you know, because you end up with a little card with a piece of dialogue on it, a post it with a little piece of dialogue on it. But in a journal, it's all right there together. Um, years ago, I was riding the bus and I heard a woman say, she was talking to the bus driver and he was trying to get her to be quiet. And finally, you know, she said, okay, but I just want to say this one more thing. Any man that would do what he did is lower than a dirty yellow egg sucking dog. And I wrote that, I wrote that down. Oh my God, I want to go sit by the woman and say, tell me more. What did he do? But I've never been able to find the play or the book that that goes in. 
but it's in my journal so that I know that there is a story around that woman saying that about the egg sucking dog <laughs> that I just have to find. So it's like every now and then I check in, I say, do I have a story that goes with that? And I don't, but because I wrote it down, I still have it yeah. in the bank yeah. of dialogue yeah. that I want to use. So it's, it's just a way to trick yourself into writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to go back to the moment you were talking about, mm, this is a bad idea, and I'm not going to do this. How do you... How do you know when to pivot and, you know, back away from something or to keep moving forward with a bad idea? So, so mm -hmm. I, what I specifically said, oh, mm -hmm. no, I just want to make sure that I'm clear, <laughs> is I said, have you ever gotten bored while you're writing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I, I have a firm theory that if you are feeling something when you're writing for the, if, if you're feeling the emotions of your characters mm -hmm. or if you're being inspired mm -hmm. by them and you cry or whatever, I feel like that you're weaving it in, mm -hmm. right? If you are bored while you are writing, <laughs> then the conversation is probably boring, gotcha. right? So like, if you get bored while you're creating it, please stop, yeah. you know? Um, and it's not like just stop writing, it's like, oh, okay, so where was I not bored? I, was, I stopped, I started being bored right here, so just delete everything else and maybe take a break and go to something else. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes you just write a bad idea. In fact, you think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And it's really painful when everybody tells you it's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you gotta get it out. Mm -hmm. You have to experience it. Yeah. And it has to hit the air so you, it's sort of like even when you have bad thoughts in your head, the, the reason it's good to go and speak to people is because when you get it out of your body, it's not as big as it was inside your head echoing, right? So even when you have, you're writing a story and you have a, a, an idea, you had to get it out so other people can see it with you and you can go, okay, I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. You can't be scared of it being a bad idea. Yeah. But if you're bored while you're writing, it's probably boring. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in? I, I, I want to admit that, you know, oftentimes writers struggle with self-doubt. And we, and, you know, it, <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, we struggle with self-doubt. <laughs> but we have to find ways to silence that inner critic and realize that, you know, even if it's as bad, somebody's going to tell me, you know, mm -hmm. um, you have to set ego aside, you know, as, as a playwright. And be open to that, but we do, it's, it's okay to have doubts and to wonder, like, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? Let me try it out on some people. Yeah. yeah, and just, and just you, you, you'll be amazed at how many people are willing to help you, um, you know, craft it into something or, or, or give you feedback and things like that. So I think that you, you don't have to realize, like, I got to have a perfect idea that's going to, you know, shake the world, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, you you will write a bunch of bad stuff before you finally get to something that that is you know it's got some meat with some meat on it and it's okay it's okay mm -hmm. to, it's, to me it's like it's just it's I used to be a person where I felt like oh I've got to write something perfect you know, the first draft but it becomes just like an exercise and exploring and experiment and having fun and just allowing myself to be free like a like a kid playing okay just allow like Paris said allowing the characters just kind of take over and just say what they're gonna say. And it, and then then it's up to me to kind of shape it into something that is that is uh, work, uh, 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 creates a story. And so yeah, so it's almost like you know, give yourself permission to have fun. You know, do something bad. Um, just don't try to stage it. But <laughs> do you know write write something bad? But then eventually you're going to come across something, and you're going to have an idea that's really good, and and it's going to start taking shape. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just you have to. I just got. A, I just was reminded. Somebody posted the statement that for all of you writers out there that are doubting whether or not your stuff is good, they made the movie Sharknado one through five. <laughs> you should write, no matter what. And we we have to remember, especially as playwrights, what we're, what we're writing are plays. So it's like play. You yeah, know, even yeah. the word is like. Just play. We, we, we're so focused on, oh, this has to be right. And it, it, yeah. we're so tight. But it's like, no, just just play. Just play and see what comes. And just like you, I, I, I have the same thing. You have to feel it first. If, you, if you're yeah. not feeling anything, the audience is not going to feel yeah, anything, you know. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Pearl? Pearl? <laughs> 
Mm. <laughs> Which is with my grandson, who was like all about the shark. You know? And the first one I watched, I was like, oh my God, this was like sharks in the house and all that coming up. <laughs> and it was crazy. And I said, this is so crazy. This one. And then there was shark made yeah. three, four, all of yeah. that. And that's that moment when you say, okay, everything doesn't have to be a masterpiece. People are going to find what they like. Yeah. And sometimes what you want is just to act silly and laugh and say, look at that. Look mm -hmm. at how stupid that is. Look at how crazy that is. And that's okay, too. But sometimes I think we stymie ourselves because we think not only does it have to be a masterpiece, but it has to be serious. You know, we're serious writers. We're going to write. And sometimes it's just like, let's see if we can write a romantic comedy. Let's mm -hmm. see if we can yeah. write something where people fall in love and it's a happy ending and I actually gave myself that as an assignment. See if you can write a romantic comedy. Because I love to watch them, but I never had thought about writing it mm -hmm. that way. Because I'm being serious. And I wrote when I had a great time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a, a new kind of way of thinking about, you know, the pleasure of the writing. Say, let's see if we can make a happy ending. Don't kill anybody mm -hmm. in this place. Let's see if we can do that. <laughs> it's, yeah. It takes you to different places. Yeah. I, I did the same thing after writing Chains Broken, which was so difficult to write. I said, oh, I can't put my audience through that again. So I'm, I just wrote a rom romantic comedy, and I called it my popcorn play. I'm like, it's not a big lesson in this. Just come, <laughs> sit, and laugh. That's it, you know? <laughs> nice. So we are getting ready to wind down and close out our conversation. I'm going to ask one more mm -hmm. question. I'm going to ask it. Then I'm going to go to the audience and give them some homework and come back so I can give you all some time to think about this. Okay. okay. I want to know what is either your theme word or your theme song for 2020. Ooh. Theme word, theme song for 2020. And if extra credit, what's 2021's? <laughs> So y'all think about that. And I just want to let our audience members know that at this moment, we are getting ready to drop in a couple of links for you to engage with. Um, the first one being a survey that we would love for you all to click on and go fill out so that you can give us your feedback and thoughts and ideas about tonight's event, but also just other things in general that you'd like for us to consider moving forward. Um, and then the second link is a reminder to, again, just Click and, and give and join and continue to support uh, True Colors Theater Company and our artists in this community so that we can continue to bring you this beautiful and engaging conversations and events like tonight's event. Um, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so that you can receive more information about how you can join us in participating in Giving Tuesday on Tuesday, December 1st. And then also uh, be reminded about our frame of mind event with our interns on Friday, December 4th. All right, y'all got it? I got it. You got it? <laughs> I do. All right, we're going to kick it off with you then. All right. I, I have two, actually. So my, my, my song, uh, of course, I'm going to Kendrick. We're going to be all right. That's, that's my theme song. Uh, and the word is, is full circle because this year has been so many full circle moments for me. Uh, I have to share this that now the Pearl is listening. 10 years and 10 days ago, I, I was with Pearl at the Alliance Theater. I was a, a, a baby playwright then, and I was sitting in the audience, and, and Pearl was, was being wise. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, just listen, listen to this. And you gave me, you handed me a, a worksheet about characters, and I took that worksheet home and I wrote, uh, my first play that I produced here, Brothers of Affliction, which is still my favorite play that I've, that I've ever written. And I'm not gonna get emotional. Just, just I am gonna get emotional. Just, uh, just that moment, just, just to see, uh, just to see it all come together, you know, and just to be in this moment now and, 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 and knowing because I didn't give up, you know, it's like, no, I, I can't give up. I, I'm a storyteller. I got to do this. And it's been very difficult to do. It's been very hard. But just to be here in this moment, I'm, I'm so grateful and I'm, and I'm thankful. So thank you, Ms. Clay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Perseverance. Must. I'm sorry. No, I'm okay. no, no it, it's an older song by Jill Scott, but it's called uh, So Blessed. And yeah. I feel that because when I think about 2020 
And personally, what I've gone through uh, to be at this moment, I, I feel tremendously, tremendously blessed. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I got here perfectly. Did you show oh, oh, okay. <laughs> What is wrong with you? I was clearing the stage so Pearl can, can, can give us our, our last words of wisdom. You know, set the stage. Excuse my, my, my me. My music, my theme song would have to be Few Little Birds by Bob Marley, which, which is just such a don't worry about a thing because every little thing is going to be all right. Oh. That's my theme song. And my word is just we can hear the truth and speak the truth and be the truth, we will come through this. And I, I know we're getting ready to sign off, but I just really want to thank you all for being writers, for deciding in this crazy time to be writers. I thank True Colors, and I just love that we are sitting here in Atlanta trying to tell each other the truth about something that I think is so important, you know, which is writing our stories, putting our truth on paper. So don't stop doing what you're doing. You know, when you say how old you are and when old music is 1980 and all that, I say, oh my God, I am really old. No. And then the other section, then I say, thank God I'm really old. Yeah. I love this, that I've been able to see these things and see all y'all writing the beautiful things that you write. Um, so don't stop, don't stop. Be very bold, stay safe and be very, very bold. Tell the truth. I love you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been an honor. Mm -hmm. Aw. Okay. See, <laughs> <laughs> so now we want to go out and have a glass of wine, and we can't do it, but we will next time. Yes. yes. Next time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so next thank time you again will. to all of our panelists. Thank you to our moderator. Thank you to you, our viewers and guests, for joining us this evening. We hope that you all have enjoyed this as much as we have. We look forward to being able to do it for you again in the near future. Um, and that's it. Thank y'all so much. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you.